Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Vine Online uh, this Wednesday evening. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, I know that everyone has so many competing demands on their time, and I just want to reiterate what a blessing it is to share this time with all of you. Uh, I know that after this uh, service, we're going to be invited to join in a fun little Zoom session for some fellowship afterwards. We'll be posting information about that, so keep an eye out for that. Um, and uh, throughout the uh, throughout the live cast, I encourage you to leave comments and uh, discuss things in the chat um, as we normally do below. Uh, we'll sing some music. We'll hear some uh, readings from the Bible. I'll share a, a message or reflection um, um, on a very well-known uh, gospel passage, um, and then we'll go into that virtual conversation space in the chat room and close out with a little bit more music and prayer. Uh, we always like to begin each service with um, a hearty welcome, a coming to center. So I invite you to just take a few deep breaths with me. Um, I always say we're Christians, so, you know, the number three is a really convenient <laughs> number to use. So let's take three deep breaths in, okay? Remember that breath is the way that God animates uh, our humanity, the way that God brings to life the very first creature, uh, Adam creature in the garden. So let's reconnect to that source of life and being, which is always around us. One deep breath in with me, okay? And release. One more deep breath in. And release. One more. And release. I feel like so much more centered, even just now after taking those three breaths. Uh, you know, often I feel like as a, as a pastor, as a priest, we were in this kind of physician heal thyself mode where the things that we're talking about practicing are the things we often don't have time to practice ourselves. So I love the vine because I get to practice the things I preach about. Um, this is a very special time for us, and it's a time for us to uh, gather our hearts, our spirits in prayer as we uh, enter into God's presence with worship, with music with uh, uh, Bible readings and such. So let's take a moment to do that together. Please pray with me. God, you stand far above over the heavens of the earth. You command the sea with your voice. You give breath to the earth and the fish swarm in the depths. You call us to reach into the waters of your creation, to draw out the treasures of your creation. You command us to become fishers of people. You command us to look to the broad ocean, to look to the seas, to search for your presence in the deep places of the world. And we ask, God, that we be faithful to this call. We ask that you teach us to be more diligent, to be uh, more desperate in our pursuit of you, of the life that you give us, of the grace that you have opened us to, even now, in this moment. Make us worthy disciples of your grace. This we ask in Jesus' most holy and precious name. Amen. There's a song in my soul, and I feel it stirring in me. I know for sure that your love is like a flood and your mercy never ending. I give my song to you. There's a joy in my soul and it's rising like the morning. This I know for sure. That your grace is enough And your promise never breaking I give my song to you And all of your goodness Is like a well running over Oh my soul Oh 
my heart Burning bright in the darkness This I know for sure That I will look upon your face Forever dwell in your presence And always sing to you And all of your goodness Is like a well running over Oh my soul It sings for you And all of your goodness I will love you forever All my songs I sing for you Yes, all my songs I sing for you Let my life me to you a symphony singing out holy holy all my days every single breath I breathe singing out holy holy let my life be to you a symphony singing out holy A reading from the first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. I mean, brothers and sisters, the appointed time has grown short. From now on, let even those who have wives be as though they had none, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no possessions and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. For the present form of this world is passing away. Hear what the Spirit is saying. song we could ever sing worthy of all the praise we could ever bring worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you worthy of every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Word. 
worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever live for you Worthy of every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever bring We live for you Reading from the Gospel according to St. Mark. After John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, 
he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. Hear what the Spirit is saying. These readings are so evocative and so powerful, and um, I, I think many of us grew up with uh, experiences of hearing this story, particularly the call of the disciples. I think of um, watching religious cartoons on Sunday mornings. I think of Veggie VeggieTales. Um, I think of the greatest story ever told, uh, other really big kind of Hollywood productions of Jesus's life. And the way that all of those productions and uh, in media really distort the underlying message of this moment um, because they fixate on this kind of romantic ideal of the rural fisherman um, who's just going about their daily business, catching their fish and hauling it in. You know, there is a kind of um, uh, uh, way that we often project an American idea, in this case, a kind of rural Americana, right? onto the Gospels that has nothing to do with the actual social setting of Jesus' day. It's so important for us to understand how we do that in a thousand different ways we do that. Um, and when we talk about things like white supremacy being a major uh, function of our religion, this is one of the ways in which it manifests. Um, because whenever we engage in those kinds of interpretive moves, what we end up by doing is suppressing the actually quite revolutionary message that's, uh, that's behind this real moment in the Gospels. Um, I want to highlight that phrase, that incredible phrase from the first reading that we heard, the present form of this world is passing away. Those words would have resonated so deeply with Jesus and with the fishermen we just heard about in Mark's Gospel. Because the world that they knew and that their parents knew was radically changing. I've shared a little bit about how important it is for us to excavate the social setting uh, of Jesus's life when we're reading the Gospels. Um, and this is uh, one of the Gospels where we actually hear the word good news used explicitly a couple of times in translation. And anywhere that we hear that word good news in the Gospels, what we're really hearing is an English translation of the Greek word Evangelion. And I just want to repeat this because I've said it before, but it's really important for us to remember that good news in the first century Mediterranean basin, that means all of the cities that are constellated around the Mediterranean Sea at that time that were essentially uh, conquered by Rome. That whole area of the world, when they heard that word Evangelion, they understood it always referred to one thing and one thing only, the emperor of Rome. And uh, it might be celebrating the annexation of new territories through conquest. It might be marking the emperor's birthday with special honors or celebrations. Um, or it might be in anticipating a, an imperial adventus, advent, an imperial visit to your city, which was a great honor. Um, and in each of those cases, uh, the proclamations that were issued were described as evangelion, as good news. I've talked about this before. The Gospels aren't maybe peripherally, you know, able to speak to politics in some marginal way. The Gospels are always and in all things simultaneously religious and political. We live in this world where we have divided out uh, uh, politics and religion. We live in a country and in an age, a post kind of rational age that I think we're actually maybe pivoting from, a weird way, but where we have uh, believed that we should separate these two spheres out. But in Jesus's world, those two spheres were very much the same, right? So worshiping the emperor, uh, worshiping the emperor as a god, worshiping the emperor's family as divine was a way of demonstrating your civic support for the empire. That's how it worked. 
Um, and Christians came under enormous fire for refusing to do that. Um, but this is kind of interesting. When we think about the way that this good news, this political term for promoting the empire uh, worked out in Jesus's day, we also have to acknowledge and understand that um, different regions that fell under Roman occupation at different times experienced varying degrees of cultural assimilation. So just because Rome took over the larger Mediterranean basin doesn't mean everything immediately in that vicinity began to look and sound and act like Rome. It took a really long time uh, for Rome to essentially remake that entire region of the world in its image. And in Jesus's own day, some incredibly important events had happened that were reshaping, literally reshaping his world. And that world was constellated to a large extent around the geography we heard in this gospel, the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee was the geographic center um, of, of the first part of Mark's gospel. Almost, you know, the first eight chapters are concerned about this particular area. And why is that? I talked a couple weeks ago about how um, the Jordan River was like the Potomac of ancient Israel. The Sea of Galilee is also incredibly consequential, incredibly important from a perspective of uh, of history, of tradition, of politics of ancient Israel. There's a lot of loaded imagery going on here, more than I could possibly unpack in this moment. But I want us to remember a couple of things that are really, really important. We all heard the story a couple of weeks ago about uh, Herod the Great, right, and the three magi and um, searching out for baby Jesus and all that. There's a moment in 4 BCE when Herod the Great dies and it sends all of Judea and Jerusalem into chaos, and it creates an opening where people, particularly peasants who feel disenfranchised because Herod preferred the empire over their own well-being, it creates an opening where they form together in a band and they revolt against uh, the whole Herodian um, dynasty. And it's an unsuccessful result, revolt. There's uh, a, a Roman uh, general, uh, governor, close by in Syria, Verus, who comes down with his, um, with his legions and suppresses the revolt very violently and destroys the city where they were gathering, Zephyrus. And then uh, Herod, uh, Herod's son, who is also named Herod, so it's a little confusing, Herod Antipas, decides to rebuild this city even more Roman and more imperial than it was before, just as a way of saying, you know, don't worry, we've got this under control these pesky, you know, uh, Jewish um, peasants aren't going to bother you anymore. You know, you can trust that I'm going to be your guy here in this region of the world. I'm going to keep the peace. So you can imagine if you're Jesus and you're Jesus's father, Joseph, and the gospel is describing you as a tecton, as uh, we, you know, we often uh, hear that as a carpenter, that probably means that they were day laborers doing artisanal work, things like masonry, things like uh, woodwork, working in and around the region of Sepphoris, around the city. They were literally rebuilding this city that Romans had leveled, had destroyed um, because of a revolt, a Jewish national revolt. They were rebuilding it in Rome's image. You can imagine how hard that would be for your livelihood to come from the very act of undoing your own pride and heritage and identity. That must have been devastating and humiliating, right? It's, it's really hard for us, I think, to, to grasp how strange that must have been. The former world that they had known was passing away. But something else really dramatic was happening. Another really big sea change occurred politically around Jesus's lifetime. And that was the death of the Emperor Augustus. When Augustus died in 14 CE, um, Tiberius came to power. And uh, once again, Herod Antipas, that little uh, uh, tetrarch so eager to prove his worth to the empire, decided to rename the Sea of Galilee the Sea of Tiberius and to build a brand new city uh, that would become the new capital of the region of Galilee called you guessed it, Tiberias, right on the Sea of Galilee. And the primary function of that city of, of, of Tiberias was to create a very solid Roman city, a city that was completely Roman from the very beginning, no question about culturally where it belonged, to create a beautiful palace for himself on the Acropolis, 
you know, really, really brown nosing the Roman occupiers at this point, really brown nosing the emperor. And equally important to regulate the fishing trade on the Sea of Galilee. This is a really big deal. We often think of that, again, that very rural Americana idea, almost like a Mark Twain notion of sitting out there with, you know, uh, uh, with your fishing pole, just, you know, catching some fish in a river. That is not what fishing was like in Jesus's time. We need to resist those kinds of images, those kinds of romantic uh, notions when we think of fishing in Jesus's time. Fishing, at, you know, by the first century in Roman Judea was a, was a major staple of the agrarian diet of people like Jesus. Their families depended on the catch to survive, right? It was, um, it was a largely subsistence operation, so they had enough to, uh, to get by them and their families, but just about enough, right? When Rome came in, they took all of that over. And what happened? When I visited Pompeii, uh, you know, if you go to Pompeii today, um, and you visit the, uh, the archaeological ruins of the city of Pompeii, and you, you wander around the city. You, you'll be brought around by a tour guide to these little outdoor cafes, and there are these deep clay vats. Um, and inside those vats was uh, a very common fish sauce called garum. Garum was like, I don't know, it was like the french fries of, of ancient Rome. It was everywhere. Um, it was a really, really popular um, export. And what happened was that the emperor essentially called upon uh, uh, Herod to extract from the Sea of Galilee these fish um, and to produce them in mass quantities for export as fish sauce, as garum, to all the, all the various parts of the empire. So you have a few things happening. One is that you have the collapse of the economic livelihood of Jesus and his followers, right? They, they are reaching a point of desperation because you have to have a license to fish on the lake. It's not a sea, it's actually a lake. You have to have a license to fish there. And then you're taxed on your haul and you're taxed on the travel, right? The, the, the way that you, you, transport, that you transport the haul to wherever it's going. And you're even taxed on the, the final product, which we don't even benefit from directly. So there's, there's a whole taxation system which is extremely exploitative You've been robbed of your livelihood. You're struggling to feed your family. That's the situation that Jesus is walking into with people casting their nets on the Sea of Galilee. This isn't a quaint little gone fishing uh, exposition. You know, like uh, this isn't like a weekend getaway trip. <laughs> you know, um, uh, to Lake Tahoe. This is some some really real stuff that's going on. Um, so in this moment, the the call that the kingdom of God has come near, follow me, has a very, very real resonance. We can't talk about kingdom, you can't talk about Vesalea without also talking about the kingdom that already exists, right? The kingdom of the Tetrarchy of Herod Antipas and the kingdom of Rome, right? So you can't actually hear those words without understanding that that is implicated, profoundly implicated in what is happening here. So what might Jesus be getting at by inviting people into a different kingdom, dropping their nets and following him? If Jesus is targeting the area that has been most recently exploited by the empire to undermine the welfare, the well-being, the livelihood of normal everyday people, then he's probably signaling something of a revolution. He's saying, abandon this exploitative system that is designed to destroy you and come with me. I have a different way of being. I have a different vision for how we can uh, divide the pie, as it were. The Gospels reflect the concern of the prophets in the Hebrew Bible who are obsessed with distributive justice. I've talked about this before. Um, at the very heart of the prophetic critique in the Hebrew Bible is a deep concern that the rich get richer on the backs of the poor who get poorer and that the people who are hungry end up not getting fed, right? It's such a simple concern, but it's interesting to see how that concern continues to translate into our own time. We might be 2,000 years distant. We might have the benefits of medical technology and everything else, but we still are grappling with these issues. They are not gone, 
right? Right now in the face of the pandemic, we're having these really big debates about stimulus checks, about how big the stimulus checks should be, about which communities have been most impacted by the pandemic, about what our responsibility is to rebuild the fabric of our society after everything that's happened. And I'm left sort of hopeful with these two different images. When Jesus does call the disciples, they're doing something, aren't they? There's two verbs. They are casting their nets and they are mending their nets. And I don't think that's an accident. I think what it means to be a disciple of Jesus is to say religion and politics matter. They matter because they equally influence and shape each other. Leadership matters because leaders have access to resources and determine how those resources are distributed. And leaders can model for us what our lives should look like at their best. That matters, right? To be a follower of Jesus is to believe those things, which means we actually don't have the luxury of being apolitical. We actually don't have the luxury of turning a blind eye to things when they happen. We can't just pretend like the Capitol riot didn't happen or that you know every side is equally. Uh, no, no, that's not true. One of the most important things for us to remember is that being a disciple of Jesus requires a certain kind of moral clarity, a willingness to tell the truth about the situation that we find ourselves in and to call out those who are being exploited into a new way of being and living that offers hope and salvation, not just spiritual salvation, but like stop fishing for the guys who are taking away your food, <laughs> that kind of salvation, real honest to God, fill your bellies with food salvation. So this is, this is my hope. This is, this is my vision for us. I want us to think about what is our agency as disciples of Jesus? How might we model the kind of leadership that Jesus is calling us to in this moment? How might we be those people who are both casting nets into waters that maybe we aren't familiar with, how is it that we are mending nets that have been broken? There are an awful lot of nets, proverbial nets in our society that are either fraying or completely broken. What is our work in mending the, the collective nets that hold us together? So we're gonna take a while to, to reflect on these questions um, and to think also about how is our own world changing? What are the things that are passing away in our world? Because we are at this really important inflection point where nothing is the same. And just because we have a new president doesn't mean that Trumpism is gone. It doesn't mean that the challenges of the last four years have evaporated. It doesn't mean we can stop reflecting on the things that really uh, require and deserve um, our deep reflection and concern. So how do we always turn our hearts in that direction? That is the, the language of repentance is to turn in a new direction. How do we drop everything we're doing and face the east, face that rising sun, face the possibility of hope the reality of salvation, and the good news that we don't have to participate in our own oppression. We can lead a resistance that imagines a different world. I'll see you on the other side of the chat.
the cry of our heart And you came down Freely you gave us your love Showing us how Make me an instrument of your peace Where there is hatred let me sow love Where there is darkness let me shine light and Cause us to open up, cause us to open up our hearts. May your light cause us to shine so bright that we bring hope into the dark. As you love
As always, uh, my favorite part of the service is hearing what you have to say about the questions. I love your observations. You're all so on point all the time. Um, and, uh, and I'm excited this week in particular because we have an opportunity after our service to just kind of fellowship with each other, to hang out a little bit. Um, I know that there are some, uh, some specific things planned, but um, just I think that that time where we get to share how we're feeling, what we're going through, what we're thinking is really special and it kind of sets us apart from other places. Uh, so I want to thank you as always for participating in that and thank you for your observations. And um, just join me before we transition into our, our little post service Zoom time. Let us pray. Ever living God, we give you thanks for this evening, for this wonderful time together. We give you thanks for the ways that you invite us out of those patterns, those rhythms of oppression that we have become so accustomed to, into the marvelous light of your liberation. We ask that you give us grace to embrace that freedom which you have given us. May we know what it is to inherit the glorious freedom of the children of God and not to be afraid of it. I ask you also for, uh, for light and for truth in this time of such critical discernment. Uh, open our hearts to know uh, how to respond to this moment, to know how to respond to the people in our lives who, uh, who see the world very differently from us, to, uh, to our communities and to our nation in ways that, uh, that cast and mend nets. Uh, and we thank you for the witness that you give us in these disciples, and above all, in your Son, Jesus Christ. It is in his name that we offer up this prayer and ask that you bless our time together of fellowship after the service. Amen. Amen.